<coughs> so I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this session about stream processing with Akka Streams. Uh, my name is Jacek Konicki. Uh, I work at Software Mill. We are a remote software house based in Poland. So if after the talk you'd like to, to chat with me either about Akka Streams or remote work, feel free to catch me sometime during the conference. <coughs> Uh, two things before I start. First of all, all the code I'll be showing is available in a GitHub repository. There will be a link at the end of the talk, so you don't need to take notes at all. Uh, and secondly, the code uh, I'll be writing is in Scala, but please don't be afraid and don't be scared even if you haven't seen Scala before. I think the code would be pretty straightforward. I'll try to explain the <coughs> maybe not, not, not so straightforward things. So please stay here even if you don't know Scala. <coughs> Okay, so what is stream processing, actually? Well, perhaps a lot of you have heard about the concept. <laughs> the general idea of stream processing is that you have a source of some kind of source of your data. We can call it a producer. You have a target place for your data, which we can call a consumer. And then you have a number of processing stages. And of course, the data flows from the producer through the processing stages up to the consumer. So you may think this is everything. But actually, in, uh, in Akka Streams, which is an implementation of reactive streams, we have some additional concept here. And if you've heard about reactive processing, reactive is basically about, about non-blocking. So that's the, the, that's the bottom line of reactive processing, not to block when you don't have to. So if you imagine such a stream processing pipeline, uh, you can basically think about, about two kinds of scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is when the producer is, is pretty slow and the consumers or the, or the processing stages are fast. So if you have a slow producer and a fast consumer, this is actual, there is actually no problem because, well, the, the consumer will never be flooded by data, the producer will produce the data slowly, and the consumer will be capable of processing everything on time. But if you imagine the situation another way around, uh, when, the, when the producer is really fast and the consumer is really slow, uh, it can happen that the consumer will be flooded by data. I mean, it, 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 it can get too much data, like much more that it's able to process, actually. Well, it, 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 and perhaps it, it would somehow fail in this situation. So in the reactive streams uh, concept, we have like a, an additional channel for, 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 the, for, for communication. So the data flows from the producer to, through the stages to the consumer, but we also have something called back pressure. Uh, and, uh, and in reactive stream, the back pressure is non-blocking. This is quite important. And back pressure is basically a way for, the, for, for a slower consumer to tell the producer that, well, I, I, uh, how much data I can accept. So, so, so in Akka streams, uh, the back pressure is, uh, is realized as, as, as signaling how, mu how much data can I get. For, like, uh, hi, hey, producer, give me n items of data because I know I will be able to process n items, for example, and nothing more. And this way, the, the, like the, like the consumer is able to limit the rate of the producer so that it's, uh, it doesn't get flooded by data and it's always able to process the data. So this is like a general idea. Uh, and of course, uh, since Akka Streams is one of the implementations, they have their own uh, terminology. So in Akka Streams, the producer is called a source. Uh, the consumer is called a sink. And all the intermediate steps are, uh, are flows. Well, actually, uh, source and the sync are also a flows in the Akka Streams world, but let's, uh, l l l let's just think as, uh, as source as a source, a sync as a sync, and all the intermediate steps as flows. Uh, if we combine them together, so, so li li link the, the various stages, they are called a graph. So, and, and the graph is what uh, is like the processing, processing unit in Akka Streams. <coughs> so, there are, there's a real number of technologies for, for stream processing. This is just a part of it. It's from my colleague's talk about uh, small intro to big data. You can even notice that Akka Streams is not here. So how is Akka Streams different from, all the, from, from the other solutions that we have? Well, first of all, Akka Streams is not distributed. Uh, if you heard of Spark, for example, and Spark Streaming, well, Spark is generally a distributed processing engine, and Spark Streaming is uh, one, one, one of its parts, which is distributed. And actually, this may no longer be true because in Akka streams, well, uh, w w w when you see the code, you'll see that will be will be like uh, there are two parts. Well, first of all, w w what we'll be writing are only the recipes for data processing, but uh, we, we won't be we won't be influencing the, the how the data is actually processed. So what what happens underneath? And in Akka streams, you have something. Uh, if you if you have your graph defined, and then you have something that is called the materializer that is actually responsible for running the graph somehow. 
And uh, up to recently, Akka Streams only had its default materializer, which is based on an actor system. But it turns out that uh, there's going to be another, an, another materializer for Akka Streams based on Apache Gear Pump. Apache Gear Pump is one of the like, distributed stream processing frameworks there. It's actually an abstraction for, for other stream processing frameworks. So the, an, an, a materializer based on Apache Gear Pump has been announced for Akka Streams. So the, the statement that Akka Streams is not distributed may no longer be true. Uh, when, uh, when defining the, the data processing with Akka streams, we create some reusable building blocks. Uh, which, uh, we, we have a DSL for creating the, the, the steps for our data processing pipeline. And it's important that when, when you create a graph, like define the graph, everything is lazy. So, so un until you actually run the graph, no processing happens anywhere. So you just have a DSL for, for, for defining your building blocks, and only when you want, uh, want to run it, you need to have a materializer present, and you, when you execute some, some kind of run method on a graph, it's only then actually run. But w w w when you define all the steps, nothing actually happens. So in our <laughs> example project, uh, we'll be dealing with some, some data stored in files, uh, the files, uh, like each file would connect, would, uh, would hold some lines with IDs and values, as you can see on, on the left. Uh, for, every, for every ID, there will be two lines with uh, which uh, either of them can hold a value or not. So, so there, will be, there will be pairs of lines with, with valid values, there will be lines where one of them can be invalid or both can be invalid, but there will always be two lines for a single ID. And to make things, well, maybe not harder, but complicated, the, all the files are going to be gzipped. Then we want to do some intermediate processing on, the, on, on our data from the files. Uh, so some, here it's, uh, it's aggregation and we'll be averaging the, the values by ID. Of course, when some of the values won't be valid in a, in a, if for, 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 a, for a single ID, we'll be using some, uh, some dummy value to, to just, to just like mark that it was invalid. And ultimately, we'll be storing our data to Cassandra. Well, of, of course, in, in our sm like sm small case, we perhaps we wouldn't need Cassandra at all, but this is like taken from a, it, it's a simplified version of a real project we made and we used Cassandra there, so, so Cassandra is here as well. And actually, if you had a, a real world scenario where you, you wanted to do fast inserts to a database, Cassandra may be a good choice, well, because well, what, what one, one of its features is that it's really fast at, at uh, accepting incoming data and inserting it. Okay, so let's get to the live coding part. I hope you can see it in the back. If not, there's plenty of room here in the front, so, so please don't be afraid to come here. Okay, so we have, we have our CSV importer class, which has some configuration parameters that uh, I, I will describe them later as, uh, as, as I'll be using them. So in our, in our like file processing code, the first thing we, we may need to do uh, is to, when we get a single line, we want it to parse it somehow to our domain model. So we'll define a parse line method, uh, which would take a line and the line will be a string. And uh, we will be processing the lines in some asynchronous fashion. So in Scala, if you want to declare that you'll, you're doing something asynchronously, uh, you use a future as the return type. So future is basically a value, but but the, like deferred one. So you don't get it. You may not get it immediately, but sometime you get it. And we'll be uh, returning a future of reading. Now, what's a reading? Reading is basically where there are two types of readings. We have, can have a valid reading, which has an ID and a value, as I said previously, and we can have invalid reading, which is it, it is basically a marker class because it, it doesn't hold the value well because the value is invalid, but it holds the ID so that it's easier to, to do the aggregation and to, to process the, the to average the readings afterwards. Okay, here we have a future block, which basically means that this will be executed in, in another thread. So this this would be a, a non-blocking call. Uh, and what, what we want to do, well, the first thing, uh, we are splitting the line by a semicolon. And uh, the values are going to be our fields. Uh, then we take the first field, we convert it to an int, and this is going to be our ID. Uh, secondly, we take the, se the second field, convert it to a double, and it's going to be our value. And now, well, uh, we could just return a valid reading with the ID and the value. Well, but of course, this is a happy path for, for, the, for the lines that are correct. And of course, while well, some of our lines may not be correct, so we need to handle this as well. 
And actually, where it would fail if a line is incorrect is the is the to double because there will be some kind of number format exception. So let's just surround it with a try catch. Well, we'll be catching everything. And here, uh, here we'll we'll do some logging just to know that there was an invalid line. And what we'll be returning here is an invalid reading with just the ID. So this is like um, a, 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 a way to mark that one of the or both of the readings were invalid. And we're actually missing a, a file path here. So we'll, we'll complicate the met our method signature a little bit. Now this is, if, 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 you, if you haven't seen Scala before, this, this may seem strange because we have two set of parameters, and, but it, it, this is basically this is something called a partially applied function. And it means that if you call the parse line uh, method with only the file path, it would return a function that would that could then accept a line as a string and this is just like a uh, it would help us to to like put the method into our into another method call which which accepts a function so we need the file path for the debugging purposes and we, we need the line to to do the actual parsing okay so this is th this is parsing the line when we have a string but uh, well we, we don't want to read our f entire files into memory because there may be a lot of them there may be big so we're going to stream the files and actually uh, when we are streaming the files, we, we're basically processing a, a, a stream of bytes. And, we th and then what we want to do is we want to detect new lines in the stream of bytes to be able to split it into, into an actual strings. So our first, uh, first building block of our processing pipeline uh, will be something, we'll call it line delimiter. And here we are, we, well, the method we defined before doesn't have, to, uh, doesn't have anything to do with Akka streams so far. Here is the first, uh, f first place where we'll be actually using the Akka streams API. So as you may remember from the previous slides, uh, we, the, the building block of a stream processing pipeline is a flow. <coughs> and actually a, a flow has three type parameters. Uh, the first parameter is the type of the data that comes into the flow, so that comes into, the into our black box. The second parameter, the out, is what gets out. And we also have a, a bit mysterious one called mat. Uh, this is a shortcut for materialized value. And materialized value is something that can be emitted from the flow to the outside world. Well, that's th at least you can think of it as, as such. Because normally when, uh, when, when, when flows, so when, uh, when, the, when the building blocks of a stream communicate with each other, they don't emit any data to the outside world. They just communicate well, between each other. But there is a possibility for a flow to emit something to the outside world, and we call it a materialized value. And actually, we will not be using materialized values here at all, so we'll, we'll just be skipping it. So in our uh, line delimiter, Mm. The input type uh, would be a byte string, which is it, it's it's a type from the from the Akka streams DSL, and it's basically a wrapper for well a, a string that that is that's built of bytes. We'll also output a byte string, uh, which only after we would convert to an actual string. And since we won't be using the materialized value here, <coughs> we would use some a type called not used. And not used is basically something that uh, that ties together the uh, the s Java's void and the Scala's unit, because Akka Streams also has a Java API. And well, in Java we have void, in Scala we have unit. They are a bit similar, but also a bit different. So the not used type is something that unifies it, so so that the like the so, so that the Java API is similar to the Scala one. So if your Java programmer is basically a void, if your Scala programmer is basically a unit. And for, for doing like Akka Streams has some has some built-in uh, building blocks for, for, for common tasks and uh, actually for uh, for processing well for, for dividing data into frames uh, we have a built-in object called framing and it has a delimiter method and what it takes well <coughs> if we want to s uh, to divide uh, our 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 byte stream by something then we need to define the separator. So here we'll just take the new line character. Then we define the maximum length of a line, where our lines are short, so 128 is a well, reasonable thing value here. There is one more parameter. It's called allow truncation. And it basically says what, uh, what to do with a line that doesn't contain the, the, the limiter at the end. So basically, if you, if you have a file that doesn't, has, doesn't have a new line character at the end, uh, it tells Akka streams what to do because by default, if the allow truncation is set to false, it will fail on a, on a line that doesn't have a new line at the end. But if we say uh, set allow truncation to true, it will just process the, the like the last line without the new line character normally, so it wouldn't fail. Okay, so this is this is first first building block, and as I said, it's lazy, so nothing actually happens here. It's just a recipe. What do what do we do with the incoming data? 
So the next step we're going to define is a recipe for parsing our files. So this is, well, we'll be using the flow type heavily because we'll basically define defining the flows, the building blocks of our, our processing pipeline. So file parsing flow would be, well, its input type will be a file, the Java IO file. Uh, the output type will be a reading, either valid or invalid, because, well, we, 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 will, we want to produce any type of reading from the files. And uh, we're like uh, ignoring the materialized value, so we say not used here. <coughs> so previously we used the framing object, but normally when you build a flow with, with su su some input type, you just say flow of file. And then you have a number of methods. On, I'll just add some new lines so that it's a bit in the middle of the screen. So for our, we, we, we will take our files, we want to stream them, and for, so for every file, actually we want to treat every file as a source of byte strings. So a source in terms of Hakka streams, so a producer of byte strings. So, we're, so, so in this case, in, in the parse file stage, for every file we want to create, we want to convert every file to a source of byte strings, and then, we want, uh, and th th then we'll do the actual parsing, and then we want to, uh, to, f to flatten all the sources. Like we, we'll have multiple sources of, of files, but, we, but what we want to emit from the flow is like a reading by reading. So that, 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 that's called flattening. So basically, we have, we'll, we'll have a number of sources, the, which will be similar to, well, to, to the parallelism we define. And then for, for, for every source, we would like to take the output value and flatten it so, so, so the readings come out one by one. So for this, we, we have a stage which is called flatmap concat, uh, and it ba what it basically does, it, it well, it, it, it changes the, it, it takes a number of sources and just flattens them to so, so that uh, the values are emitted one by one. Uh, so here we are, we're going to have access to the files, so the ev uh, to every single file that gets into our flow. So since the, since the files are gzipped, we'll create a gzip input stream which would uh, wrap a file input stream. Created from our file. Uh, and then we have a helper, a helper object called stream converters, uh, to which we can pass an input stream, actually a function that returns an input stream. So here we have an anonymous function that just returns our, our stream that we haven't yet saved to a variable, so it's going to be a stream. We have the stream here, <coughs> and what it actually is, uh, when you check the type, so it's a source of byte strings. So basically, from every file there will be byte strings coming, but we'll be like we, we, we could we, we could flatten them then. So for every for every byte string that comes comes out from the files, first thing we want to do is pipe it through the line delimiter stage. So we'll, we, we have a stream of bytes and we pipe it through the line delimiter that we defined before. So now the, the output of the line delimiter is a byte string. Uh, then what, what we want to do, uh, we may, as you may remember, we may have a header line in the file, so the, the name of the columns. So optionally we may want to drop it from every file. Uh, and uh, actually we have a config parameter for that called lines to skip. So for every file will be will be f first we'll be like passing it through the line delimiter to, to, to get single lines. Then we'll be dropping the first line because well it's a header line. And our, our line delimiter outputs byte strings, but we want normal normal strings that that are accepted by our line parsing method. Uh, so we call the map stage. And map basically is like a like a map on a collection in, in, in Scala or Java. And actually a byte string has a handy method uh, UTFA string which just converts it to string. So now we have our lines as strings, and what we want to do at the moment is convert every string line to a reading using the method we defined at the very beginning. And we want to do it asynchronously because, well, it's w we want to preserve the order because the order of the line is important since, since they are grouped by the ID, but we want to do it asynchronously with some, s some level of parallelism. So we have a map async uh, stage. And it basically, well, it, it it's also a partially applied function. It takes uh, the parallelism level. And for our non-IO operations, we have a config parameter called non-IO parallelism. So, so the, the, this is for all the operations that don't require any, any resources like disk or database or, or something. 
<coughs> and then we, 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 we need to pass the actual function that takes a string and returns a future or something. So the function we defined at the very beginning, the parse line one, actually does, does, does this, well, actually after applying the file path to it. So we'll say parse line. Uh, here we call it with pa file get path. And what it ret returns is the function that takes a string and returns a future of reading. So this is, th this is the processing step. Once again, we're taking, f for every file, what we're doing is first we're, we're, we're applying our line delimiter to extract, to, to, to split the, the byte stream by new line characters. Then we drop the configured number of lines, for example, the single one, which is a header. Then we convert every line, which is now a byte string, to a normal string that we want to work with. And then in an async fashion, we convert every, every string to a reading. So, and here we use the parse line method we defined at the very beginning. So having our readings, we are ready to, well, actually, uh, uh, like a, a stream of our readings, we're able to group them by two and then compute the average. So this is, this is going to be the next, next, uh, next processing stage. It's going to be called compute average. L once, uh, and once again, it's going to be a flow. Uh, it would take a reading and the output value would be a valid reading. So, so our, our average computation accepts any readings be, the, be it valid or an invalid one. But what we want to output is, an, is, an, is a valid reading, which has an ID and has a value. Of course, in, in the case when both the lines were invalid, we would, we would emit a dumb, ju just a dummy value, but we always want to emit uh, something that has an ID and has a value. So we will be emitting a valid reading and not using the materialized value. So here, once again, our entry point is a flow of reading. So we have, we have incoming readings. And what we want to do now is group them by two, because every, every two lines share the, share the ID and they may contain a value. <coughs> and then we, w what we want to do is process them, like uh, again, compute the average in an asynchronous fashion. But this time, since we, we already grouped the lines by two, <coughs> the order of computation doesn't matter. So uh, previously we used the map async method, but it turns out that there, there is also an, another variant of it called map async unordered. And the difference is that map async preserves the, pr like it, it executes asynchronously, but it preserves the number, the pre preserves the order of the results. So, so even if, if some result is computed faster, but it, 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 uh, it, uh, it arrived uh, later in the, in the incoming stream, it would be, they, they will be output in order. <coughs> but map async and order doesn't care about the, ab ab about the order of completion. It, uh, it emits the value downstream as soon as it's computed. So of course it's faster, but sometimes sometimes you need to preserve the order as we did in the in the previous stage. Here we don't uh, don't actually care about the order because well we're just we're just computing the average values and we we don't need the order anymore. So here the parallelism would uh, once again would be this non IO one, and what uh, what we get here is uh, is readings because it's a well actually it's a it's it's a sequence of or, or a list of two readings every time because, well, there are, th th there are a pair of lines sharing the same ID. Uh, so what we want to do with the readings, well, since we're, uh, once again, we're doing it asynchronously, so we'll wrap everything in a future. And the first thing we want to do, well, to compute the average, we, we, want, to, we want to extract the valid readings because, well, the invalid ones don't have a value, so they won't be useful for computing average. So we'll take our readings, and now do a, a collect operation. And basically, for every reading that is an instance of a valid one, of the, of the valid reading will return it. So this is basically filtering, li like filter with instance of, if you, if you wrote it in Java. So we're basically fil filtering out only the, the readings that are instance of the valid reading. And we'll call it valid readings. Uh, there is there is a filter method, of course, but well, it's, it's it's basically a matter of style because in the filter method you would need to to use the the instance of operator to to check the instance of the class. And here, you, well, s s some people may call it more elegant because you're using pattern matching here to to detect the type of the the, the object. Well, it's, it's it's basically the same. So you you could also we, we could also say uh, something like readings uh, filter uh, is instance of valid reading. So this would this would be the same. It's as I said. It's it's it's, the, it's a matter of only the matter of style. So we now we're ready to compute our average. So if there are any valid readings, 
uh, we want to extract value from them, the value from them. Mm, value. Mm, actually, it, let's check the type of it. Oh no! So the type, the type doesn't match. Yeah, because so so uh, actually there is a difference because be, because here the output type is is still is, is still a reading. So we we're, we're getting a sequence of readings, and if we just collect, we only we will we'll, we'll get the actual valid readings. So well, <laughs> thanks for this question because this this was something new for me. So uh, we're going back to the collect variant. And uh, we return this one. And now, when we check the type, it's actually a sequence of valid reading. So, since we only we only collected as a single type, uh, the compiler knows that the that the type of the output collection will be a bit narrower. So now we're going to sum the values and divide them by the size of valid readings. Of course, this might be a bit of overhead when there was a single valid reading only, because then we could just return it. But for the sake of like simplicity, we I don't want to write another an, another like if branch here. Just let's say that we'll be like uh, a bit not not too performant when when create uh, computing an average of a single reading. And otherwise, if uh, if the if the valid readings were empty, so there were none of them, we'll just return a dummy value of minus one. And what we want to return here is a valid reading. And si since we always had two, two readings uh, as, as an input, uh, we can just uh, take the first of them and take the ID from there. And for the value, we'll be using the average that we just computed. So this is the average computation step. Once again, we take, we take our reading stream, group it by, 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 by in, in groups of two, so that we have the, like two, two lines in a single collection. Then we, extract, then we filter it to extract only the valid readings, and then we, we compute the average. So the mm, pre-final step uh, will be to store our readings in the database. And this is well. This is going to be a flow that accepts a valid reading, since we only want to store valid readings in the database. <coughs> the output value will be uh, the output type will be the type that is returned by our Cassandra driver somewhere under the hood. So we, we we don't really get into details, but this is a result set from the from DataStax driver, and the materialized value is not used once again. So this is also pretty simple because we have a flow that takes a valid reading. Uh, we can store the readings in a, also in an async fashion, but uh, this time, since this is an I/O operation, we'll use a different level of parallelism, and uh, we have a configuration parameter called concurrent writes, so this so, so that we can we, we can adjust how many writes we do in parallel. Here we get a single reading. Well, and we have something something called reading repository that has a safe method. And the, the safe method, well, it takes a valid reading and returns the future of the result set. So that's everything we need to know about it. Under the hood, it stores the value to, to a local Cassandra instance. So we're going to save the reading. Uh, and then we, we, we'll just do some logging. Just that our logs are not completely empty. Uh, the and then method is something uh, it's called a combinator on the future and what it basically does it's uh, well it can it can it can in intercept the future when it is completed do some stuff and return the original future so here we are we, like when the future is complete we'll do the we'll, we'll see whether it completed with a success or a failure do some logging accordingly and then return the original future so that that's all and then does well, and th this is this is actually the, the the whole flow for for storing the readings. So now we're going to combine the building blocks we defined so far to to act to to build a, like a larger flow to process, which will be capable of processing a file and returning the the result set. So we we will call it uh, import single file. Uh, this is going to be a flow that take takes a file, returns the result set. And we don't care about the materialized value once again. So now this is a, this is flow of a file. Sorry. And now it gets pretty straightforward because we just use the via method 
to define the the, sub the 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 subsequent stages through which we want to pipe our our data. So the first f first stage will be parsing the file. Uh, when we parse the file, we want to compute the average. And then when we have the average computed, we want to store the readings. And this is it. So this is so, so, so you can see that when you when you define your building blocks as 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 as, as variables or as vals here in Scala, you can you you can you, you have a pretty simple DSL that just lets you combine them. And it's important that this is uh, everything here is type safe, so that the compiler checks whether the types of the flows are are fine. For example, if I if I switched it. Uh, switch the order, the compiler would say that, well, the compute average actually accepts uh, a valid reading and not a reading, which is emitted by, and, and not files. So, 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 so on, on, on in compile time, we have, uh, we have, we already have some checks whether it's, whether it would work or not. Or actually whether it's legal to do or not. <coughs> so this is almost our entire processing pipeline. So let's now define a method which would do the actual actual processing. So we would well we, we have so we have a configuration parameter for our import directory. We want to ex list files in the directory and then like put all of them uh, send all of them through our processing pipeline. So let's define an import from files method. And what it will return is a future, well, because it's, it's everything happens in an async fashion, so it's non-blocking, etc. And the type of the future would be another mysterious type from Akka called done. And done is a bit similar to, to not used, because it's basically a unification of, uh, again, of void and unit. And, he in, and uh, uh, when not, not used indicates that we don't, uh, don't care about the materialized value of a flow, and done indicates that we don't, uh, d d d like don't care about the value that is emitted by after, after running the graph. So, so, so it basically says that, well, let's run the graph. Actually, our graph will have our graph when it's run will have a side effect because it's going to write to the database. So we actually don't care about the about the value that we, that will be returned. So we we just care about the fact that it completes. And this is what 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 done is for. And technically, it's just a unification of Scala's unit and Java's void. So we have our configuration parameter for uh, for import directory. Uh, we just say uh, list files uh, convert it to list. From an array, because well, we, we have a, when we'll be creating a source from this sequence of files, uh, an Akka stream source, and it has a constructor that takes a list, not an array. So that's that's ju just for this. We'll store it in a variable. Let's make some more space here. Uh, now we want to do some logging. We'll, mm, we may want to measure the time it took to, to import it, so let's, let's, have, let's have the start time here. Now <coughs> we're going to have multiple files that we want to send through our pipeline, but of course we wouldn't want to, to send them one by one. So we would also leverage the, the power of Akka streams and, and of the parallel processing. So we would like to, to, to do a kind of load balancing. We would, have a, we would like to have an input to our, to our graph that would load, load balance the files ac across a number of workers. So we, we would like to define a number of workers which would process the files in parallel and, and, and do some kind of load balancing. So there is one final stage we'll need to, well, a flow we need to define. We'll call it balancer. And uh, so far we'll, we'll only uh, stay with the type. So it's, it, well, it, 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 its type is it's similar to the import single file flow well, because the balancer takes a file uh, it returns a result set and we, we skip the materialized value. <coughs> Let's leave the implementation unknown for a second. But basically what it will, will, will be doing, it will be taking files, load balancing them between a number of workers, and then, uh, then like merging the, the, the results of the, of the load balancing and sending the, the parsed files one after another to the, to the next steps of the pipeline. So now to run our entire graph, <laughs> we'll, we need to start with a source, as this is a starting point for, for, for data processing. So we have a source object, and here we pass the files, the list we created. And what we want to do is like pipe it via our balancer, because the balancer will be taking care of, of uh, actually executing the import single file flow. Well, not executing, but passing data there. And now this is th th this is the first place when we actually do something about running it. So so, so we say run with, 
And well, we define the source, we define the intermediate steps. The only thing we have to define now is the sync. And in our case, uh, as I said previously, uh, we actually won't care about uh, what, what, what is the value returned by our processing pipeline because we only want to, want to know that it has finished. So there is a handy string called ignore, which basically uh, when, when you run the flow with sync ignore, it returns the future of done. So that's exactly the return type we want. Now we can, we can s and it returns the future, so we can once again use the and then combinator to, to do some logging. It, it would print the elapsed time and, and stuff like that. <coughs> okay, so now it's time to implement the, 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 the load balancer itself. And here we'll use uh, a, a bit different approach than we used previously because we won't be using the, uh, the built-in uh, build stages, so that the methods that we can call on a flow, but we will build a simple processing, uh, a, a simple graph from scratch using a graph DSL, which is another way in ACCA streams to define the, the processing steps. So we'll have a balancer graph, and now we're using the uh, graph DSL to create it. Uh, what we get here as an implicit value is, is something called the builder. And builder is basically like our, our way to access the structure of the graph. So if, we, if, if we'd like to, want to, to, if you'd like to add uh, a, a something, a processing stage to the graph, we'll be using the builder, builder instance to, 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 to add the elements. Uh, we'll also use uh, import uh, the DSL for, uh, for, for the, well the, the methods of the graph DSL. You'll see them in a second. <coughs> and now, as I said, we want two steps. Well, first of, first of all, we want the balancing step that would just like t take a file and, uh, and, and choose, choose a worker that is available and then send the file to the worker. And then after, af after we do the balancing, we have, we have split our pipeline to like an, a number of, uh, an, of sub-pipelines. So, and after they are, they are done, we want to merge them back. So, so we have like a single input and a single output, but we, we, we have multiple pipelines in the middle, but we want a single output. So the first stage that we want to add will be called balance. And now we call the builder add. And we have a built-in stage for load balancing, actually. We need to provide a type. Its type would be file. And the number of, uh, number of branches is also is one of our configuration parameters. It's called concurrent files. So we have the balancing step. And now we, so we, we split the pipeline. Then we want to merge the results back. Uh, so we'll need another stage called merge which is also a built-in one. Uh, so we're going to add a merge here. The type of the type parameter of the merge will be the result set because that's the like final thing that comes from our out, our, out of our pipeline. And the number of, uh, of inputs to the merge block will be the same as the number of outputs of the, of, of the balance block. And here, of course, well, th there, there's no way to verify it at compile time, but this would actually be verified at runtime. So the, I, I'll implement one more step, like co co connecting everything together here. And now we'll be using the, the fancy arrows from the graph DSL. So now what we need to do is to basically iterate uh, over our concurrent files and for every like the, the, the number of times uh, as specified in the concurrent files, we need to connect, uh, w we need to add uh, like a, a, a connection uh, between the, the balance stage. Uh, the data from the balance stage should be, should be sent to import single file. And from there, it should be sent to the merge stage. And the arrows you see here are from the from the from the graph DSL. So if you, if you had a bigger graph, it's it, it uh, well y your code could look almost like a drawing. So with with all the arrows connecting all the building blocks, and this defin uh, well yeah. And uh, what we have to, to return at the very end because this is, this is a graph, uh, and every every graph I, I said at the beginning that actually uh, source and uh, things are also uh, are also sh are also flows, or they are graphs actually. Uh, and every graph in ACCA streams has a shape. So, and the shape basically says how many inputs and how many outputs uh, a graph has. So a source is a graph which, which has a source shape, which means it has only a single output. A sync shape has only a single input. And uh, in our case, it would be a flow shape. And the flow shape has a single input and a single output. So just, ju just as we defined the flows before, but here, we, here we're just using the DSL. And, uh, our, and the input of our flow would be the input of the balance stage. 
and the output will be uh, the output of the merge stage. Uh, so this is the definition. Uh, and here, uh, and our actual balancer flow will be built from the graph we defined, just like that. And now the, thi the, the, the things here, all the connections between the stages, well, they are not verified at compile time, but they would be verified in ra at runtime. So, so, so as so when, when, when the graph is actually built and materialized, ACA, the materializer is going to check whether uh, whether actually the number of inputs and outputs matches. And if not, there will be an exception. Yes. Mm -hmm. Will you not over, um, overwhelm the, 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 the writing to the database because then instead of you just call up? Yeah. When you just call up, you had this uh, concurrent writes, and instead of, of, of just being concurrent writes, now concurrent writes plus uh, times concurrent writes plus. So it's just mm. one. Yeah, you're right. I haven't noticed that before. So the question was whether we aren't actually making more concurrent writes that we, we that we configured, and actually we are because now when we <laughs> since store the store readings uh, part, the store readings flow is a part of the import single file stage, which we are executing multiple times because we are we're using it within the load balancer. And yes, actually the now now the number of inserts would be would be concurrent files times store times uh, concurrent writes. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have any prizes. If I had any, you, you would certainly get one, but sorry for that. <coughs> okay, well, the, the last thing we need to do is to somehow call the method we just, we just wrote. And so here we have our simple application. Uh, we have the CSV importer and we say import from files. So let's now jump to our compiler and see what happens. So we're going to run SBT. <coughs> and compile. And now we see there's a number of problems here. Well, there are actually two kinds of problems. First of all, is that we are doing some manipulations on futures. And uh, to do some manipulations on the futures, for example, to use the and then combinator, we need something that is called an execution context, which basically is a thread pool uh, that, that is used to, to, to execute the async operations. And in Scala, you need to be, you need to be explicit about what kind of thread pool do you use. So it's it's actually a good idea because every time you're you're doing some asynchronous processing, you you, you should like think well what, what what kind of processing it is, what kind of resources it may need, and what kind of thread pool do you want for it. Actually, you can you can make a workaround, which we will do because there is something called a global execution context, which is well uh, d defined. It's always in the application, and using a global execution context, especially for uh, for I/O operations, may not be the best idea. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity in our application, it, it would be enough. And the second kind of problem uh, is, the, is, is at the very end, is that we want to run our graph, but we, as, as I said, our graph is only a recipe for data processing. And actually, we don't, have, uh, we don't, ha we, we don't know yet don't uh, know yet how to run it. And for this, we need a materializer. And this is also an, a materializer is an implicit parameter to the run method or run with in our case. So here, here the compiler says that, uh, hey, you need a materializer. So you need something that will actually run, run your recipe. So we're, we're going to be using the, the, ac the actor system based materializer. So the default one. Uh, so let's let, let's just uh, use uh, an implicit actor system. Let's de define define an implicit actor system so that basically an implicit value here says that well the actor system will come from somewhere when we when, when we when we create the class, and it will be there. It's an ac actor system, and actually uh, an actor system well it has a it, it has a thread pool that we will be able to use as the execution context. So actually, I lied before because we won't be using the global one. We will be using the the, the one from the actor system, which is even a worse idea in a real life scenario for especially for I/O operations because the the execution context from the actor actor system is responsible for all the communication between actors. So if you execute an I/O operation on the system on on the, on the execution context of the actor system, and if you block it by by some accident. Then, th then the entire actor system may stop functioning. 
So don't do it in production. This is this is all uh, on only for for simplicity. But this 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 is the fastest way to to obtain an execution context here. And here, since we we have the run with method, which what was the shortcut? Yeah. So this is this uh, shortcut that shows the the implicit values. Sorry, that are needed. Uh, and you can see that. Let me try once again. That actually the run with method takes an implicit uh, materializer. So that's what the compiler complained actually. So if we need an implicit materializer, let's create one. <coughs> it's an actor materializer. Oh, sorry. And it's a value. And here you can see that the actor materializer takes an implicit actor system, but we've already defined an implicit actor system and, uh, in the class definition, so we'll, we'll have it here. And actually, where the where the actor system comes from is is here. So in the in, in our application, we define an actor system for the application. It's an implicit value. So when we create a new instance of the CSV importer here, it is passed an implicit value as an implicit value. So it's it, it's provided there. So let's get back to the compiler. Really? Okay, I, I'm not sure whether I can do anything about it. Um, okay, something is wrong here. Okay, this should be fine, so I'll, I'll just... Uh, Okay, I need to use this one because it's recorded. So let's just not, not dig into what's wrong, but but just get the working version. It's it's the same, I mean it's must must be some kind of a minor mistake. Okay, so we'll say compile. Now it compiles, uh, so we're ready to run it. And uh, I have a Docker with Cassandra running here. Uh, we can connect to the to the SQL shell to see what's happening there. We have a NACA stream sta readings table which is now empty. So now we can try to run it and see what happens. Well, it, it may take a, a couple of, of seconds, well, depending on whether it's warmed up or not. And actually, if you if you go to the GitHub repository, I'll be linking at the end. Oh, it was faster than I thought. Uh, you also have the, the random data generator. So if you wanted to play with it yourself, you can you can try to generate a number of, 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 of those random files, then perhaps play with the different configuration settings to see how the parallelism levels influence the, uh, the, the velocity and the, the, the processing speed. Okay, so uh, that was for the live coding part. Of course, there is more, as, as usual. <coughs> Actually, you have already seen how to implement uh, your own uh, your own graph with uh, with the graph DSL. So, if you don't want to, if the built-in uh, stages are not enough, you can build your own. Uh, you can also build your own flow. So, for example, that uh, with, uh, with with some kind of other DSL, it may also be useful because, for example, you, you may need to to do some stateful operations within the flow. It's also possible. I've actually written a blog post about it and contributed one of the custom flows to the Akka Streams contrib. So, so you, you may go to the blog and, and and see if you're interested. So that's all I had today. Uh, under the QR code, you have a link to a landing page which has uh, links to GitHub, links to the blog post, and some contact information. And vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. And you have any questions? I know we. I think we're almost uh, done with the time, so you can well ask now or catch me later. I'm here un until the end of the conference.